Ayun po. Mag-live po ulit po. Oh, okay na. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, brethren of Royal Christian Church. Maybe there are also some who are watching this live stream. Blessed Sunday to all of us. And indeed, we are thankful to the Lord that despite our current situation, we are not hindered from joining our hearts and spirit together as one in worshiping our God. And in the midst of what we are facing right now, allow me to start this message on a lighter note. It's not because I am not taking this crisis seriously, but it's because I believe that we as Christians, we as God's people, could still smile through the pain or be joyful in the midst of our trials. So again, allow me to start this message on a lighter note. And R.C. Sproul, the late R.C. Sproul, in one of his lectures on this truth that we will be looking at this morning, tells of this story of a mountain climber. And this mountain climber, while he was up there, slipped on a ledge. And as he was about to plummet, and he was, he, he fell thousands of feet to his death. But as he started to fall, he was able to grab a branch of a tiny tree that was growing out of a crack in the face of the cliff. So he was able to grab a tiny tree as he was about to plummet to his death. And as he clung to the branch, the roots of the small tree began to pull loose and the climber was facing certain death. And at that moment, he looked up, he looked up to the heavens and he cried out, Is there anyone up there who can help me? And surprisingly came a reply. He heard a rich baritone voice from the sky saying, Yes, I am here and I will help you. Let go of the branch and trust me. And the man looked up to the heaven and then he looked back down into the abyss and thinking of his imminent death, finally he raised his voice again and said, Is there anyone else up there who can help me? Now, we may find it funny to hear of such story as that. But the point is, seriously, the point is this. There is somebody up there. And he is our all-powerful God, reigning in heaven. And he is willing and he is able to help his people. We have a God who is in control of all things. He knows how things will turn out. He makes no mistakes. And He only has good intentions for His people. And this truth about who God is can be captured in this word, providence. And again, in the midst of this crisis that we are facing right now, one of the truths that should give us confidence should be the truth or the doctrine of God's providence. So, with that, our title for this message would be Finding Confidence in God's Providence. And this is some sort of a topical sermon 
on God's providence. But let me just use this passage as a jump up verse to what we will be looking at today. And this passage is from Genesis chapter 50 verses 18 through 20. And it reads, Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. Shall we pray before we move any farther? You please join me in a short word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, indeed we are thankful for this morning, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, that in spite of what is happening around us, in spite of the truth that this world is decaying and even we ourselves physically we are on that decaying process of God yet your word assures us that your mercies are new every morning O God and with that we praise you Lord we thank you O God for this truth that your grace is fresh and we can be assured of that fresh supply of grace every day of our lives in Christ alone, O oh God. So Lord, as we meditate in your word, continue to speak to our hearts, continue to comfort us as we go through this challenging, challenging times, O oh God. And Lord, whatever things that you may be pleased to do, may all of this be for your glory alone, O oh God. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So this passage is familiar for most of us. We are familiar with the story of Joseph, right? And his story, the story of Joseph, is a good example of the providence of God. So let me just refresh your mind with the story of Joseph as we breeze through his life story in the book of Genesis. Joseph was favored by his father Jacob and because of that Jacob gave Joseph a colorful coat and because of that Joseph's brother hated him again because of that favored treatment that he got from their fathers you can see that in this passage Genesis 37 3 and 4 now Israel or Jacob loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And there came a time when Joseph fell into the hands of his brothers far from their father's watching eyes. So they plan to, to grab that opportunity to kill him. But in the end, they simply sold him to some caravan traders going down to Egypt. That's now in verses 18 and then verse 28. In verse 18, they saw him from afar. They saw Joseph. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. That was their initial plan. But again, they ended up trading or selling Joseph to these traders. Verse 28, then Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. So in Egypt, Joseph was sold to Potiphar, the captain of Herod's guard. He served Potiphar well and became steward of his household. 
down chapter 39, verses 1 through 4. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. So life started to get well with Joseph when he was there in Egypt. But that was not to be for long because Potiphar's wife made illicit or sexual advances toward Joseph and when Joseph refused she became angry and accused him of attempted rape you can see that here after a time his master's wife Potiphar's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said lie with me but he refused and said to his master's wife behold because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. And because of that, again, Potiphar's wife became angry. And she accused him, falsely accused him of rape. She called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me. And I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. And because of that false accusation, verse 20 tells us, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. So he was falsely accused and was thrown in prison. But while he was in prison, this is what happened. Joseph met Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker who were also in, in prison. You can see that now in verse, verses 1 down to verse 3 of chapter 14. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord of the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. And while they were there, G Joseph was able to interpret the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. And both dreams came true. We will not look into those verses. And sometime later, after the cupbearer was released from prison and restored to his job, he told Pharaoh about Joseph's ability. And Pharaoh summoned Joseph to interpret his own dreams because Pharaoh was also having these dreams that were disturbing him. And this is what happens now. Genesis 41 verse 1 through 7 after two whole years now this is Pharaoh's dream Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile and behold there came up out of the Nile seven cows attractive and plump and they fed in the reed grass and behold seven other cows ugly and thin came up out of the Nile and after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile and the ugly thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So that was his dream. And Joseph was able to interpret it. And this is now Joseph's interpretation. 
Verse 25, the dreams of Pharaoh are one, Joseph said. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good years are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow for it will be very severe. And because of that interpretation, Pharaoh was grateful. So what he did was he appointed Joseph as the prime minister of Egypt and tasked him with preparing for the famine that was about to come. And when it came, the famine affected Joseph's homeland, Jacob's family, Joseph's father and his family was starving. So what Jacob did was he sent some of his sons down to Egypt to buy some of the food that the prime minister had been wise enough to store away for the Egyptian people. So when they were there, the sons, they encountered Joseph, but they didn't recognize him. But he recognized them. And then Joseph hid his identity for a while. He didn't tell them. But finally revealed that he was their long lost brother. That's in chapter 45, verse 3. At Joseph's invitation, Jacob moved his entire family to Egypt. Years later, Jacob had died. The brothers became afraid that Joseph would take revenge upon them for selling them into slavery. So they were afraid. Now our father is gone and Joseph could use this time to take revenge on us. So what they did, they, they made up a story saying that Jacob had told them that he wanted Joseph to forgive them. But that was a thing that they should not be worrying about. Why? Because J Joseph had long since forgiven them with what they did to him. And that's why we go back to our opening passage in Genesis 15, 50, 19, and 20, where Joseph tells them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So that's a, a summary of the life of Joseph. And in the drama of the life of Joseph, you can see a lot of players or actors in his life. You have his brothers, you have Potiphar and his wife, you have the cupbearer and the baker, you also have Pharaoh and other characters. And G Joseph recognized all those characters. But not only that, Joseph saw another player in his life. And for Joseph, this player was over and above all these other players in his life. And who was he? He's the Almighty God. Joseph, with his eyes of faith, was able to see God's invisible hand as the one who was behind everything that happened to him, both good and bad. Joseph trusted in the providence of God. So, what is divine providence? What is divine providence? The English term providence is derived from two Latin words. The first is pro, it means 
beforehand or seeking in advance. And the second word is V-Day. Pro and V-Day. V-Day means to see. Therefore, providence means seeing beforehand. Seeing things in advance. So if applied to God, this would then mean God sees everything in advance. He sees everything, all things He sees beforehand. That's the providence of God. One author, Wayne Grudem, author of Systematic Theology, has this definition of providence. He says, God is continually involved with all created things in such a way that He first keeps them existing and maintaining the properties with which He created them. Second, God cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to act as they do. And third, God directs them to fulfill His purposes. That's the providence of God. And the implications for this truth are quite wide. On the one on one end of the spectrum, God's providence could be terrifying. It could terrify us. Because by nature, we want privacy, right? We want privacy. We don't want others prying on our private lives. We hate it when others would stop our FB accounts. We don't want that. We, we have our secrets, our personal secrets that we don't want others to know. But with God, with His providence, nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden. That's why it could be terrifying if we are trying to hide something from God, especially our sins. Remember the first time sin entered the world? Adam and Eve, they immediately experienced a sense of nakedness and shame. Genesis chapter 3 verse 7. And what they did was they reacted by attempting to hide from God. Why? Because they experienced the gaze of the God of providence. That's why it could be terrifying. Because sometimes we only want God to look at us when we need help. But sometimes we just want to do things our way and we want God not to look at us. But He won't. His gaze of providence is constantly upon us. And that's why the doctrine of God's providence can be a terrifying thought. That's one end of the spectrum. But on the other end of the spectrum, the concept of God's vision, of God seeing us, should be comforting to us. Remember Jesus? And this is what he says in Matthew 10, 29, as he talked about the providence of God. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And that's comforting. To hear those words from Jesus Christ as he talks about the providence of God. So this morning, my aim for this message is, as, is that we as God's people, we might find confidence and comfort in knowing that our Heavenly Father is benevolent, He is good, and He is caring. He knows what we need before we ask Him. And when our needs arise, is both able and willing to help us. Now that should bring confidence and comfort to us to know that there is a God of providence who is aware not only of all our sins, but also of all our fears, our pains, and all our fears as His people. And for today, we'll be looking at just one aspect or one facet of God's providence. The second aspect will be for next Sunday. So this is the first part of a two-part message on the providence of God. 
So this morning, we will look at the first facet of the providence of God. And what is that? Providence is first divine sustenance, being sustained by God. Again, Genesis 50 verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Again, we have looked at the life story of Joseph. He was he went through those tough times. And why was Joseph able to endure those difficulties? Imagine being mistreated by his brothers, sold to slavery, falsely accused, and imprisoned. I mean, why was he able to endure all those things? And it was because he saw the invisible hand of God moving behind all those things. God in his power sustained Joseph. Providence is being sustained by God. We are all familiar with this logos or brands right they are watchmakers not only watchmakers swiss watchmakers not only swiss watchmakers but they are famous swiss watchmakers as far as watchmaking is concerned these brands are above everyone else why because, for one thing, the parts that they use are of high quality. Steel, surgical steel, as I've read. The metal gears and all those parts are made of such strong quality. And the face of their watch is made of crystal sapphire. And they are scratch resistant. And not only that, these brands make their watches in such high precision in such high accuracy that you could they would just wind up the watch and the watch would be running on itself for an entire lifetime of yours maybe even more and that's why they they itself they can just wind up the watch again and left it running on its own but the, but the sad thing is this is sad thing there are people who would compare god to a swiss watchmaker they would say they're into this deism teaching they're deists and they would say that god in his power yes they would acknowledge that god is powerful he created the universe and everything in it but they would say that after god created the universe and everything in it god just left all of these things to run on its own according to them according to this teaching god is a powerful but a distant supreme being according to them he is not involved with his creation but the Bible tells us otherwise. The Bible tells us in His divine providence, God didn't just create the universe. He is very much involved with His creation. He didn't just create us. He is involved with our lives even at this very time. He sustains us. God is not the great watchmaker who builds the watch, winds it up, and then steps out of the picture. No, that's not our God. Instead, He makes, He preserves, and He sustains. That's providence. That's being sustained by God. And as we talk about God's sustenance, we can see several aspects of this. Allow me to share just two of these aspects of being sustained by God. First, divine sustenance assures us if you're a child of the living God, it, is assure, it assures us of God's protection. 
In God's providence, we are assured of His protection. This time, we will look at another passage. Acts chapter 23, verses 12 through 15. And it reads, Then when it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we kill Paul. Now therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his cause by a more thorough investigation. And we, for our part, are ready to slay him before he comes near the place. Little background. Paul was commissioned by God to be his witness to Rome. That was his mission from God. And then this severe trial comes his way. What's that? There was this plot to kill him. And what was involved in the plot was more than 40 men. More than 40 men was part of this plot. And notice in this passage, these more than 40 men who bound themselves under oath to murder Paul, they were terrorists. They were terrorists because they knew that killing Paul, because Paul was under Roman guards, and they knew, this man knew that probably when they did that, at least some of them would, would be killed in that attempt. Or some of them could be apprehended and then executed for doing such thing against Roman soldiers. But these men, they were like modern, they are like modern day suicide bombers. They were willing to die for their cause. That's what's happening to the Apostle Paul at this time. And then what happens next? If we move forward in verse Verses 16 down to verse 21. This is what happens next. There's this plot. The life of the Apostle Paul is at stake. And then this happens. But the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. And he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Leave this young man to the commander, for he has something to report to him. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner called me to him and asked me to lead this young man to you since he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand and stepping aside, began to inquire of him privately. What is it that you have to report to me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council as though you were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them, for more than 40 of them are lying in wait for him who have bound themselves and are cursed not to eat or drink until they slay him. And now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. So the plot again, and then this happens. Now from a human point of view, you might say, well, it just so happened that Paul was able to discover the plot against his life. As we would say in our local expression, na timing nga lang. Na nakibalo si Pablo nga na ay plano, na pakiyon siya. Or you could further say, it just so happened that Paul's nephew was there in the right place and at the right time. That's why they were able to find about this plot. Was that coincidence? No, it's not. It is providence, God's providence, the invisible hand of God arranged all these events and used this to save the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, how does this relate to us today? Today, our trials may be different from that of Paul's. His was persecution and ours Maybe not. Most likely for 
for people today, the main trial, the major trial could be our, this pandemic that we are facing. Or you could also have other trials aside from this major trial. The, but no matter what, the kind of trial we may be having right now, the same truth holds true for every trial. These trials have their way of threatening our lives. These trials, in a way, threatens our faith in God. It threatens our security in God. It takes away our confidence. That is true for every form of trial. But for the child of the living God, the same truth also holds for each one of us. What is that? God in His divine providence assures us of His protection. He is arranging all these things with a view that we, as His children, are being protected by this Almighty God. Divine sustenance assures His children of God's protection. Secondly, the second aspect of being sustained by God. Divine sustenance assures us of God's provision. We go back to Genesis 50 verses 19 and 20 again. Joseph tells his brothers, do not be afraid, for am, not, am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present truth to preserve many people alive. The circumstances in Joseph's life, again, both good and bad, was allowed by God with his good intentions. It's there. God meant it for good. But we can also see that his brothers had their evil intentions against Joseph. Joseph also tells them that you meant evil against me. Joseph didn't sugarcoat his brother's evil action. Joseph didn't call evil as good or good as evil. Now, evil things will happen to us in this world. And those who commit such acts will be held accountable to God. Well, let's balance this teaching. Let's we use the truth of God's providence as an excuse for the evil things or sins that we will have we will be doing or we are doing right now. You could say, I did that because of the providence of God. God led me into doing those evil things. Like this, like this story. Again, Arsis Paul tells of the story of two men. On February 12, 1938, two men had a private meeting in a mountain retreat. In the course of their conversation, one of the men said to the other, this is what one of the men said to the other, I have a historic mission, and this mission I will fulfill because providence has destined me to do so. That's what he said. This man had an understanding that the purpose of his life was under the shaping influence of divine providence. And then he went on to say to the other gentleman in the course of their conversation that anyone who is not with me will be crushed. The man said again, he has this destiny to fulfill because of providence. And he says, those who are not with me in this mission will be crushed. In other words, you will be killed. And you know who that man was who claimed this providential destiny? It was this man, Adolf Hitler. This was the man who, because of his anti-Jewish and obsessive pursuit of Aryan supremacy, he fueled the murder of some 6 million Jews, along with other victims of the Holocaust. And he claims it was providence that led him to do that. Now that's evil. That's clearly evil. And we cannot blame God for that. Again, let's balance this. We cannot blame God for evil. 
James says, James 1, 13 and 14, says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. We cannot blame God for evil. We cannot use His providence as an excuse for the evil things that we did or we are doing or will be doing. So let's go back to Joseph. Going back to Joseph, again, he sees the evil intent of his brothers. You meant it for evil. But on the other hand, Joseph also sees that in God's providence, God only has good intentions in all things. What good intentions? For one, God sent Joseph to Egypt to make preparation for the famine and thereby to save many lives, including those of his own family. Because of those things that Joseph went through, both good and bad, God was able to bring about a good in that. And again, that is, Joseph was able to make preparations for the famine and thereby saving the lives of many people, including those of his family. And the question is this. Did Joseph know that, that, would, that it would end that way? Now think about this. While he was there, falsely accused and languishing in jail, was it clear to him that it would end this way? No, he didn't. He didn't have a clue on how it would end, especially with the things that he went through. He didn't know that it would end in such this way. But... The thing is, even though Joseph didn't know that, Joseph knew his God. He knew that his God was good. He knew that God was graciously at work in his life. He knew that behind all the events in his life, there was this invisible hand of God sustaining him. And Joseph trusted his God. And his God didn't fail him. His God sustained him and provided for him. Now let's remember, the God of Joseph is the very same God that we are serving right now. He is the very same God whose invisible hand is behind all these things that is happening to us right now. And we also can have the same assurance as that of Joseph that God will provide for us that God will graciously sustain us as we go through every trial in our life. He's the very same God. Look at what Jesus says about this. In the midst of our worries and anxieties at this time, Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? So at the time, at this time of crisis, uh, I believe we are all looking for confidence, peace, security. And people could be searching for those things in a person or in some object or in some circumstance. But again, the point is, we all want to have that sense of confidence, security. And for most of us at this time, one of the things that we could be doing is we go through those news, right? And we would look at some, some updates. So is there a vaccine yet? Has the curve been flattened? Are the lockdowns or quarantines working? Now, definitely there's a good side to to be looking at those things. But Jesus, Jesus tells us differently. He tells us of a different way to find confidence. 
look, look at what he says. He says, why don't you go outside? Why don't you go outside and give a careful thought about the birds? And that's what he's saying. Look at the birds. In the midst of all these things that are happening to us, Jesus tells us, look at the birds. Give careful thought about the birds. You can do that outside your house. And he says, look at the birds. They don't sow. They don't plant. They don't, they don't harvest. They don't have barns that they can store their food into. And Jesus says, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He feeds them. He cares for them. And then he, he gives us this rhetorical question. Are you not worth much more than they? Again, that's a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a question whose answer is so obvious that you don't need to answer that question. Rhetorical questions are rather posted so that we could be brought into a deep and careful thinking. And Jesus says, think about this. If, our, if your Heavenly Father cares for those seemingly insignificant birds, how much more you, his sons and daughters. So again, at this time of trials, it would be of great significance to us if we pause and think about the Father's providence in sustaining us, in protecting us, and in providing for us. It would be good for us to ask ourselves, will he care for me? Will he provide for me? Will God be at my side as I go through this? And Paul answers that. If that's your question, Paul answers that with this. In Romans 8, 31 and 32, where Paul says, What then shall we say to these things? Those trials that come our way. If God is for us, who is against us? He who does not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If you are a child of the living God, a born again believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the assurance that whatever situation you may be in, be it good or bad, God is with you. And he is not just with you. He is 100% for you. Because he didn't spare his own son. Therefore, we can have the assurance that God in his providence will sustain us, will protect us, and will provide for us. And so in ending, God's providence is one of the most comforting truths revealed in Scripture. Dear brethren, it reminds us that for the believer, the loving Father that is revealed in the Bible knows all about our every need and even our fears more than we do. And because He is Lord, He is willing and able to protect us and provide for us. And this should give us confidence in His providence. Now before I close in prayer, you might be there, you might, you might happen to watch this live stream, and you could be there and maybe you're not, you're not even sure of your relationship with God. You're not sure if you're saved with God. Let me say this. As we talk about the providence of God and all His good intentions for His people, let me say this. The greatest display of all his good intentions was displayed at the cross of Christ. As we talk about providence and being sustained by God, protected, provided for by God, you start at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because if you talk about all the good intentions of God, again, his greatest among his good intentions was displayed. What is this? greatest good that we could ever have as human beings it is being forgiven of our sins 
at the cross of Christ, in God's providence, the Father allowed Jesus Christ to be a sin offering. He came, He lived a perfect life, and He offered Himself at the cross to be a sin offering so that whosoever believes in Him will have the assurance of being forgiven of their sins and being given eternal life. So if you are watching right now and you have not <clears throat> come to that point in your life, let me lead you into having this assurance of being saved and forgiven of your sins. You go to the cross. And there the cross, you admit that you are a sinner. We're all sinners and we cannot save ourselves. There's nothing in us that merits God's forgiveness. That's why Jesus came and He died as a sin offering. And all you need to do is admit that you are a sinner and you repent of your sin and you come to Christ and place or put your faith in Christ and what He did in the cross. And you accept Him as Lord and Savior in your life. And you can do that right now, wherever you are. And I assure you this, if you do that from your heart, God will indeed forgive you and accept you as his son or daughter. So, again, let me lead you to a prayer. Wherever you are, if you are happen to be watching this video and you're not yet sure of your salvation, let me lead you to a prayer. Just pray from where you are right now. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and I cannot save myself, O oh God. And I ask forgiveness for my sins. And I repent of my sins, Lord. And I put my trust in Jesus Christ that at the cross, He died for my sin and He was raised by Your power and accept Him at this time to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Once again, if you did that, let me assure you, God will honor that if you prayed from your heart. And for the rest of us who are sure of our relationship with God, once again, I hope and pray that as we go through these tough times, we will indeed find confidence in the providence of God. So with that, let's pray. Our dear loving Father, the Lord, we are thankful that we have a God who is in control, who is powerful. Not only that, we have a God who is mindful of us, who is very much involved with the very lives of His people, oh God. Thank you that even at this time we're for most of us are struggling with fear and anxiety, oh God. Thank you that you know all of this, oh God. Thank you that in the midst of the things that might confuse us at this time, we know that your invisible hand is behind all these things. And we know that you only have good intentions in bringing about these things, oh God. So we choose to trust you, oh God. Even though we have fears and we are anxious and we have confusion in us, we choose to put our trust in you. That indeed, you are the God of providence, assuring us that you will sustain us, you will protect us, and you will provide for us. And with all of this, we are this time careful to bring back to you all the honor, all the glory, and all the adoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a blessed Sunday. And God bless us all.